How's it going everyone? I hope everyone's doing well. I haven't had time to make a video in a couple weeks, so I'm really excited to make this one for you today. And it's gonna be an important one, very important one. But just to give you a little rundown on what's been going on with me, I've been diving really deep into the realm of numismatics, specifically American numismatics. And uh, I want to get into collecting more American numismatics so I'm just trying to learn as much as I can right now about it. And I just picked up this book, the uh, official ANA grading standards book. That It's like an original copy. And uh, I learned a lot just from reading the introduction of this book. So a lot of good resources in this. It gives you picture drawings on how to grade coins. And uh, I could have gotten the uh, updated version but I decided to go with the original just because I kind of wanted just, uh, you know, it would be cool to have an original copy. I have a few bids online right now for some pre-33 gold coins. So that is going to be my next purchase, a pre-33 gold coin. And uh, when I receive it, I can't wait to show it to you. But today I'm going to be talking about the United States Constitution and just give you a little history and explain to you how our Constitution is supposed to operate. See, a lot of times current events trigger thoughts in my mind, and sometimes I think those thoughts are, uh, are important enough to share with the community. And if you ever noticed in the description of my channel, it states that my channel is about uh, spreading the message of liberty and stacking precious metals. And if you ever noticed, the liberty part comes first. So this isn't exactly a, a stacking channel, but it is a a channel that about liberty that talks a lot about stacking precious metals. So I just want to put out this video because it has to do with the Constitution and um, this whole abortion thing going on with uh, a couple of the southern states. And this video is not about my stance on abortion, but it's just to explain everything that's going on right now from a constitutional and historical perspective. And I'm going to explain to you how our Constitution is supposed to work. So just in case some of you haven't heard yet, Alabama and Georgia just passed some strict uh, legislation regarding the, uh, the banning of pretty much most abortions in their states. And basically there's a lot of people up in arms saying, oh, Roe versus Wade, the states can't do this. It's unconstitutional. So to be honest, anyone with that viewpoint has absolutely no knowledge on how our constitution is supposed to work, how our political structure is supposed to work. See, the U.S. Constitution is based off of enumerated powers. And what does that mean? It means that the powers of the federal government are enumerated. They're numbered. They're few and defined, as James Madison stated in the Federalist Papers. But unfortunately, most Americans today do not understand that concept they don't, they don't understand American history. They're allowed to vote, and unfortunately, it has completely changed the, the structure of our government in an illegitimate way. See, the truth is we don't have a constitution anymore. Our constitution is unwritten because it's not based off of enumerated powers anymore, but it's based off of unconstitutional, erroneous, Supreme Court rulings, which have completely misinterpreted the original intention of the U.S. Constitution. One thing that most Americans do not understand is that America is not one nation, and it never has been. It is not one nation, but it is a federation of nations. We live in a federal republic not a national republic. So the states, let me put this down. So I live in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Well, what is a Commonwealth? A Commonwealth is a country. When Pennsylvania was formed, it was the nation of the Quaker and the Pennsylvania Dutch people. A nation is cultural. The people of Louisiana are not like the people of California. Just like the people of California are not like the people of Alabama. And there's not much bigger threat to culture than centralized government. 
because people of one culture can force people of another culture how to live their lives. And that does not unite people, but it does the exact opposite. It drives them apart. And this is exactly what the people of all the states wanted to prevent during the time that the states ratified the U.S. Constitution. They didn't want to be controlled by other states. And that is what true American conservatism is. American conservatism is wanting to conserve your culture, wanting to conserve your culture. And how, what is the best way to do that? By decentralized government. That is why the key principle to the founding of the United States was that the states maintained their sovereignty, that the only powers that the federal government had was what was delegated to them by the states. Those delegations are enumerated in the U.S. Constitution and the powers of the federal government and of, of Congress specifically are enumerated in Article 1, Section 8 of the U.S. Constitution. So if it is not in Article 1, Section 8, or if it is not in any amendments of the U.S. Constitution, then the federal government has no role or authority over it. Everything else is left to the states. That is how, that is the original structure of this country. That, that is the constitutional structure. That's the legal structure. And it is very important that the states maintain their sovereignty because that helps ensure that we are free, that nobody 2,000 miles away tries to force us how to live our lives. Many of the problems today in America is caused by American nationalism, which is really fake na nationalism, but I'm not going to get into that right now, but it is American nationalism. It's what Trump wants. It's what the left wants. It's what everyone wants. Everyone wants American nationalism. One nation, under God, indivisible. That is all garbage. And the Pledge of Allegiance was written by a socialist, if you didn't know, named Francis Bellamy, known socialist. So where in the U.S. Constitution does the federal government have an enumerated power dealing with abortion? It doesn't. That clause, that amendment does not exist. So the federal government has no jurisdiction, no authority over abortion laws in any state. So the thing with Roe versus Wade, right? Completely wrong ruling. See, all a ruling is, is the opinion of the Supreme Court and nothing else. And there is no worse body of people to decide whether a law is constitutional or not than the, the, the federal government itself. Obviously, they're going to rule everything constitutional, eventually at least. It is not up to the federal government to decide what is constitutional or not. It is up to the state. They are the ultimate check of the authority on the general government. And I think that maybe the justification that they, they used in Roe versus Wade, I haven't read you know, the entire case, but I think, did they use the, uh, the Fourth Amendment, like their right to privacy, as um, saying that any abortion laws in any states are unconstitutional? I, th I think that's what they used. Well, this in and of itself shows you that those judges were either lying or they have completely no understanding whatsoever on our political and constitutional structure. So first of all, the Fourth Amendment does not protect your right to an abortion or the right for a doctor to perform an abortion. All the Fourth Amendment does is protect your, your private property from unreasonable searches and seizures by the U.S. government. And another thing on top of that, and I know I may turn some of your heads upside down with this one, but it has been proven through historical facts that the Bill of Rights does not apply to the states. It only applies to the federal government and no one else. And this can be proven simply by just reading history, reading the ratification debates reading the Federalist Papers, even though, you know, I wouldn't recommend completely relying on the Federalist Papers because they did have some, uh, some erroneous thoughts in there as well. But we have to read the history, the writings of the men, 
of the generation that ratified this Constitution in order to understand it. And if you read that stuff, you would know that the Bill of Rights does not and has never applied to the states, ever. And it still doesn't. It was even ruled by the U.S. Supreme Court that the Bill of Rights does not apply to the states in Barron v. Baltimore in 1833 and also in the in the slaughterhouse cases of the early 1870s so technically a state can make a law that prohibits a right that's recognized by the US Bill of Rights as long as it's not in their state constitution see that is how our our state sovereignty works all right it it's the state constitution that's important all right and the state constitution constitutions are structured differently than the, the, the U.S. Constitution. See, the U.S. Constitution is based off of enumerated powers. So whatever, the, whatever is not enumerated in the Constitution, the federal government cannot do it. See, with the state constitutions, it's the opposite. States can pretty much do whatever they want as long as it doesn't explicitly say in the Constitution that they can't. All right, so, so U.S. government... Uh, can't do anything if the Constitution doesn't have it as an enumerated power. State constitutions, they can do whatever they want unless the state constitution expressly prohibits the state from doing it. So it can be proven that the Bill of Rights does not apply to the states with some historical facts. So James Madison, during the drafting of the, of the Bill of Rights, proposed a, an incorporation amendment, which applied the Bill of Rights to the states, and it got rejected. Before, during, and after the ratification of the U.S. Constitution, states had laws that went against the Bill of Rights. There were a couple states that had state religions. You know, Pennsylvania Pennsylvania had, had some strict gun laws after the ratification of the U.S. Constitution. So, obviously, that is another example of and proof of how the Bill of Rights does not apply to the states. And you'll have people say, oh, well, all that changed with the 14th Amendment. No, it didn't. That did not change with the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment has nothing to do with applying the Bill of Rights to the states. And, uh, and even the people that drafted it themselves said it didn't. All the 14th Amendment was meant to do was constitutionalize the Civil Rights Act of 1866 and nothing else. You cannot use the 14th Amendment to argue that the Bill of Rights applies to the states. It just doesn't make any sense at all. And you can prove that the 14th Amendment does not apply the Bill of Rights to the states because after the 14th Amendment was ratified, there is an, a proposed amendment to apply the first amendment to the states and it got rejected so why would that amendment get rejected or even proposed why would they even have to propose that amendment if the 14th amendment applied the bill of rights to the states it's because it didn't and anyone who believes that it did has simply not read history or they're just trying to morph the history that they've read into their, to serve their own biased agenda, their own biased political agenda. Really a worry back in the day during the ratification debates and all that, the, people didn't want a Bill of Rights. Really, to, to be truthful, the Bill of Rights was a bad idea. It was a bad idea because they didn't need it. All right. they, they didn't need it because the U.S. government could not do anything that was not enumerated. So if gun regulation of U.S. citizens was not an enumerated power, then the U.S. government couldn't do it. That is why we do not need the Second Amendment. What we need is protection of our gun rights in our state constitutions not in the U.S. Constitution. Because, like I said, the states can do whatever they want as long as it doesn't say that they can. That is why Bill of Rights are a good idea for state constitutions. But it is a bad idea for the U.S. Constitution because it insinuates that 
the general government can do stuff that is not enumerated. We do not live in one national government. The states do not have to follow the Bill of Rights. I'm not saying I agree with that. You know, remember, I'm a, I'm a voluntarist. I'm a libertarian. But I'm just looking at things from a lawful, constitutional perspective. And I understand that we have to operate in the, in the real world. We can't just go straight to, you know, anarcho-capitalism. The first step into achieving more liberty, less tension in America, more unity is through decentralized government and by promoting trade, promoting freedom, promoting voluntary interaction. That is how we unite America. We don't have to be under the same gigantic coercive monopoly to be united. And this concept of decentralized government leading to more freedom can be traced back all the way to the medieval feudal times of lords granting land to vassals and, and the vassals having control of the land and there were multiple vassals and the vassals even gave out chunks of that land. And during that time, government became more decentralized and that led to more liberty because the government was closer to the people. That is what we need. See, the ultimate sovereign is within the individual. So the closer the government is to the people, to the individual, the more free we will be. We're not going to achieve freedom with people like Donald Trump and all the idiots in Congress and all the idiots in the Supreme Court. We're not going to achieve that by them because all they want is one powerful, centralized authority. One American people. So if you guys want to change things, if you want to end the Federal Reserve, if you want more freedom, if you want to preserve your culture, then we have to do this from the bottom up, not the top down. People in Alabama need to understand that they have to let you know, people in New York do what they want to do with their abortion laws. And in my opinion, which are crazy abortion laws up there. And New York also has to understand that they have to let Alabama do what they want to do with their own, in their own state, in their own culture. So just to give you a, a historical background, you know, this is not one nation. It's never been one nation. We are a federation of nations. The federal government cannot do what is not enumerated in the Constitution. And abortion is not one of those enumerations or one of those amendments. And everybody has to realize that we do not live in one nation. We live in sovereign states, individual sovereign states that, that have united for the common goal. And those common goals are pretty much, you know, commerce and, and defense, according to the U.S. government's enumerated powers. It shouldn't matter what California wants to do in their state. It shouldn't matter what New York wants to do in their state, Alabama wants to do in their state. They can't control each other. Because the federal government cannot constitutionally regulate the internal uh, operations of a state. That is the state's job, not the U.S. government's job. They are to govern, like I said, make sure uh, trade is free among the states, federal defense, negotiate with foreign countries, foreign treaties. That's pretty much it. And the only things that the U.S. Constitution prohibits the states from doing are clearly defined in Article 1, Section 10. The states can't coin money. They can't enter foreign treaties, stuff like that. It doesn't say anything about abortion. And here's the thing. It's just funny. Most American conservatives today are progressives and they don't even realize it because they believe in one nation, indivisible. The supreme power of the U.S. government. That is not a conservative idea. That is a progressive idea. You know, there's a lot of conservatives out there that, that would like to choose to make abortion uh, illegal nationally, which, like I said, we don't live in one nation, but throughout all of America. That is a progressive perspective. We have to focus on nullification of these unconstitutional laws by the U.S. government because the states do not have to follow them. That's what people have to understand. 
anything that is not enumerated in the Constitution, the states do not have to follow. It is their duty to nullify it. But uh, I hope you guys got something out of this. And uh, just read history, read the ratification debates, and uh, come to your own conclusion. So, and if you guys want to learn real American history, real economics, from, from PhD historians and, and economists that actually know what they're talking about, and if you want to support this channel at the same time, then go to my affiliate link in the uh, description below, and that will take you to Liberty Classroom. Tom Woods is Liberty Classroom, and Tom Woods is a, uh, a PhD historian. You could also listen to his podcast. I've learned so much from the guy, and um, it's, it's basically, you know, it's got to be hundreds of hours of, of college-level lectures with, with several classes on economics, philosophy, um, history, and I use it myself, and I have learned just such a vast amount of information and um, I, I don't regret purchasing it at all. It, it's the, the, the value that it gives you, the knowledge that Liberty Classroom gives you is far greater than, than its cost. So that's why I, um, I feel very comfortable promoting it on this channel. And uh, I don't think you'll regret it. Now, it's not like a fancy production value or anything. I mean, it's literally just professors giving college level lectures and you know sometimes with powerpoints but but like i said if you just want to learn true american history economics and really get into the weeds of it and and learn things that barely anybody else knows check out libertyclassroom.com you can check out tom woods's podcast and you can go to libertyclassroom.com by hitting the my affiliate link in the description below and i would greatly appreciate that if you are interested to click that link rather than going directly to the website. So thanks so much for listening, everyone. I highly appreciate it so much, and I'll talk to you later.